opening in progress. Harry, welcome back. How are you doing, buddy? I'm great, Nick. How's it going? It's good. I'm good. I've had a good week. Yeah, it's my. I had my first run since my injury, which I think we talked about in episode two or three. You, you, you already first, recovered. That's good stuff. I wouldn't recover. Yeah, it was a slow one and probably a little bit too soon, but I, I got through it. So I'm in pretty good spirits. I finally be able to start exercising again, which is always good for mental health. Um, but I had something I wanted to to raise with you today. An interesting uh, question with a client of mine, funnily enough, a coaching client who was talking to me about uh, generative AI or for those that may or may not be familiar with chat GPT in particular, I'll go into to more context about what that conversation is about in a moment, but it brought to me an interesting topic of conversation. I wanted to bring to you being, you know, mindfulness expert, you've done a lot of work around mental health. You've studied it in, 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 in detail. We now know, thankfully, I think it's a good thing, certainly in the work that I do as, a, as an HR recruiter and an HR podcast as well, we talk a lot about mental health and it's become a widespread topic. It's now in public domain. I think hopefully a lot of the stigma around mental health is is not what it used to be and people are much more confident in being vulnerable you know confident about being vulnerable and confident raising these issues i think there's been a big cultural change in relation to people talking openly about mental health issues i think the, the qualms we had about talking publicly about such issues have, have kind of dissipated a certain amount and i think a lot of that has been down to ai because there's been an influx of apps and and mindfulness tools and meditation tools and soundscapes and things we can access on our smartphones that have been had had a part to play in the 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 evolution of of that stigma being you know being reduced in the public domain but i wanted to ask your view on ai whether you use it in any of the tools that you use whether you think it's had a positive or a negative impact on mental health yeah um, yeah it's a big question i mean i think it, it, i would probably argue that i'm not sure it's that AI that has had that the effect that you're talking about I would say for me like firstly the word mental health when I was a teenager never even heard it right I'd probably only heard it as an adult and I only really think about it being thrust into the limelight actually personally um when um when bizarrely enough Prince Harry and Prince William started talking about it about right. seven years ago um and then even then, it was not talked about by, say, politicians and things like that, I think, until the whole pandemic. I'm not sure, like, I believe that apps such as, you know, Calm, Headspace have done a good job in terms of propagating this idea of mindfulness and uh, well-being and meditation. I'm not sure, I mean, and, and obviously that's all part of mental health. But I'm not sure I would argue that AI has contributed to to publicizing mental health. And what I would say, actually, if anything, I'm very suspicious of the whole the whole thing. Um, you know, call me a, an 80s child who grew up uh, watching uh, Matthew Broderick in war games. Um, but um, I suspect the problem is um, for me is that there's a bigger issue here, but I see that as humans, as part of our evolution, we're still in our infancy. So by that, I mean, if we were to define humanity as a, as an, as a person from birth to death, I would say that we're about three years old right now. And that's when you start to play with toys and you start to break things and you don't really understand what you're playing with, but you discover this new stuff. And that's where I feel we are with a lot of what we're learning, uh, including AI, which, you know, I've I've played a bit with ChatGPT. In fact, I'm going to play with it some more tomorrow. Um, I think it's uh, been helping me with trying to come up with a book title for the new book that I'm writing, as well as the back cover blurb. Um, and it can be used. I mean, it's like many things, right? It can be used for, for good or, or not, depending um, I think ultimately it's going to have a massive part to play, right, in every aspect of the working world. Even the other day I was chatting to a colleague of mine and she's a speaking coach and she was working with a client who was looking at, I'm not sure if it was ChatGPT or some other AI system, who were to, to kind of help people with their public speaking skills and it, it pitted her against the AI to analyse a speech and it did quite a good job, apparently, of 
picking up all the, you know, how much of a percentage of her of that conversation was pausing versus not and, and other things. But what it did miss was, which I think <laughs> it still can't replicate and replace at the moment, is more of the emotive part and the emotion and the personality. Sure. Part. It's the humans uh, that contextualize information. I don't think robots yeah. have got the ability yet to contextualize. But for those, just for clarification, for those that may or may not be familiar, and it'd be surprising how many people aren't familiar yet with with generative AI uh, things out there. So that's what ChatGPT is a generative AI platform. It's a it's a effectively a an AI interactive system, a, a chatbot that that is actively and avidly being used for people to to ask questions of it. And it, it's, a, it's a language-based um, AI platform that gives responses back based on all the information it has access to. And that's mm. where people are using it now to, in one, and there's many uh, ways people are using it, but one of those ways is to ask for mental health advice, for example. Um, now, that wasn't why ChatGPT was created, but you can use it for that method, just like you can in the example you gave to help you with public speaking or to help you create a book title. You know, it, it, it's a language model that has access to millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of data points that can come back and give you a, a relatively intelligent response. So people are, because of that, people are using it now to ask their mental health related questions. And it's coming back with pretty intelligent answers, but it's whether or not we can rely upon that information, um, yeah. you know, where, they, where, where it comes from. I think bringing it back to the app-based question, I think the openness that we've experienced towards mental health has definitely allowed for an emergence of more relevant smartphone AI related apps. So I do think there's been a response from the from the providers, the, the developers out there to the phenomenon being more more widely accepted or talked about in, in, in public, you know, in, in, in public, should I say. But is it are the smartphone apps also driving society to be more upfront about their mental health? I think potentially they are as a, as a response. I think something is worth from my perspective, you may disagree on this, but mental health is something we all have. The stigma has been associated with mental health as it being a negative thing. You know, you, you go back, you said you're an 80s child. Well, when I grew up as an 80s child, I'll be thinking of, you know, think mental health. You think of someone in a straight jacket in a room, yeah. you know, trying to get out of an asylum. And, he, he, you know, in terrible, terrible terms used to exist of he's at the, the funny farm or you know, all these kind of things that used to exist out there. When the reality is all of us have mental health. It's the health of our mind, our brains are, you know, it's it's whether or not it's we are struggling with negative yeah. mental health or, or whether it's ill mental, mental health, health mental Correct. illness or mental you know, or mental problems. illness as well, which is something completely different. That, that, and that's totally different, right? And I think the stats are like I don't know whether it's in any given month or every any given week, one in four of us will suffer from mental health issues. But reality is, it could be one in one of us really, because I think a hundred percent of us do. Uh, and I remember it being. Um, illustrated once at a speech um that you know if you were to sprain your ankle or something like that uh one it's it's more visible right that that you have a physical injury but also you're more likely to sort of say you know oh you know i'm not gonna play football today because i've got a sprained ankle right as opposed to you know oh, i'm not gonna come into work today because you know i'm feeling a bit down or whatever the thing might be um it's definitely changed i i've noticed a massive shift in the last five years now whether that's I think that's been societal, but obviously because I, I work in certain spaces, you, you, you are so, sometimes at the mercy of being in a bit of an echo chamber where you, you feel like, oh, everyone knows about mental health and everyone knows about meditation. Everyone knows about yeah. brain work and, and actually they don't by and large because it's not, you know, it talks about. However, you know, when I do catch glimpses of the news or papers or things like that, um, I'm seeing more of that propagate. Um, I mean, I guess do i think that the apps have helped that along i think it's it's i guess the apps have demonstrated the need because for example if you've got you know something like headspace then gets downloaded millions of times then the data and the numbers are showing that there's a requirement right that there's a there's a reason people are downloading this so in that respect it's definitely helped so then people have obviously seen these things are more and more. But, but that's not necessarily associated with mental illness. That's because people want to take a proactive approach to yes. positive mental health. I think that's a real positive I mean, change it, that we've seen. Is it proactive or is it reactive? I feel like most people that are turning towards things like Headspace and Calm 
are doing it to solve a current issue that they might have, right? Whether that's stress, whether that's not being able to switch switch off at night, whether that's, you know. Do you? That's interesting. I don't know the data on this. You may know more than me. I, I would say that most of, most people, maybe because I'm, I'm talking about for my own personal uh, you know, way of using these apps, it's always been nothing to do with those reasons. It's because I want to be proactive about being more mindful, making space for me. I, you know, you always ask me, are you still meditating, Nick? Are you still trying that? You know, I'm, I like to try new things. I want to try and be a better. But that's your personality. Better. That's your, that's your, yeah, you're, you're similar to me in that regard. And, and that's probably what's driven you towards things like coaching and, and, and everything else is that you are, you're actively always looking to have self-improvement and, and improve yourself. And, and for me, the way I came to, I guess these mental health tools, if you want to call them that, like meditation and mindfulness and anything else, is because not necessarily I felt I needed them, but because I saw other high performing people mm. and uh, and they were they were talking about it and doing it. In fact, actually, I was watching um, Ted Lasso. I don't know if you ever watched Ted Las- Ted Lasso. Um, Ted Lasso. Yeah, Ted Lasso. Yeah, Ted Lasso. Love it. One of the best right. things I've ever seen on television. Yeah, it's his, brilliant. His, his view on life is just fantastic. It's, it's brilliant. My my dad lo- is addicted to it as well. Anyway, so I'm watching series three with my folks at the moment, and we yeah. watched uh, the latest episode where they they've got Zava, you know, the big footballer, what, yeah. in, right? And he's sat there before one of the games with all the with all the rest of the crew, and he's doing like meditation and things. And and I was saying to my mum because my mum's still a bit kind of thinking about meditation as being sticking your head in the sand and ignoring everything. I'm like, look, see, look, they've even got it here as like high performing people, like athletes have always been, not always, but have been doing meditation, like high performing CEOs, high performing, they've been doing this for a long time. Uh, Jerry uh, Seinfeld, for example, I'm sure he's been meditating, I think for about 25, 30 years, right? People have been meditating for 30, 40 years. And it's only recently that you're starting to hear about this because it's kind of, coming out of the closet a little bit more. You know, it's new because I don't know what year it was. I should do as a football fan. The year that Glenn Hoddle was the England manager and he brought in these experts. You know, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That was when he, he was for the World Cup and he was he was really... He was cool. massively criticised for it. It was yeah. quite new age then to have anyone come in and look at the mind, the mind side of performance. We yeah. now know it's hugely important and you've got experts here, performance experts yeah. working on the mind in, 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 in all... Well, this is the thing is that it was only, I think he, he, when he was out, the next person that came in, I think maybe it was Sven Goran Eriksson after him. I'm not sure if it was or not, but then he brings in, I'm pretty sure it's Sven Goran Eriksson that brought Steve Peter, Peters in, didn't he? Or did someone else? Yeah, put, well, quite possibly. He was quite forward. Thinking yeah. So, that. and so Steve Peters, for those who don't know, wrote a very, quite a popular book called The Chimp Paradox, which is effectively, you know, talking about similar stuff that I'm sure Glenn Hoddle's guru was talking about. I'm not sure, yeah. but maybe did it in a bit more of a scientific, less woo-woo way. But suddenly that became more accepted. I guess he was getting the results as well, with, you know, with Ronnie O'Sullivan. I mean, that's what it comes down to, right? And, and yeah, yeah, and Chris Hoy and, and people like that, uh, the cy- British cycling team. So he had that reputation anyway. But um, yeah, I mean, like, if you go back, I don't know, you're you're obviously familiar. you familiar with Phil Jackson from the Chicago yeah. Bulls? Yeah, I am indeed. Yeah, I've, 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 I've read some of his stuff as well. He's on, yeah. yeah. Exactly. So he, um, for those of you who don't know, he's, I think, now won 11 championship rings as a coach and two as a player in the NBA. Uh, six with the Chicago Bulls and five with the Los Angeles Lakers. But he famously brought in um, lots of ideas to the Chicago Bulls of the 1990s, such as Zen Buddhism and meditation and That's right. mindfulness and um different uh, teachers to help the people like Dennis Rodman and uh, Shaquille O'Neal and Kobe Bryant yeah. Michael Jordan Didn't he co-write the mindful athlete I was just having a look um I I think that's a book I recommended to you recently wasn't it George, George Mumford and I think that's Phil Jackson yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no well he didn't co-write it he might have written the forward for it but George okay. Mumford was the coach that Phil Jackson had brought in to help people like right. Um, okay. Michael Jordan and so on. Uh, but it's a great book that my father, I did recommend that to you because I thought you would resonate with it because it, mm. it's teaching about similar, they all say, say the same stuff really, but you know, just sometimes the way that it's delivered can resonate with different people. Um, so a lot what my point being that a lot of this stuff has been there in the shadows for a long, long time. Um, I think with both the internet, possibly apps as well, 
you know, the proliferation of the, these ideas has become more commonplace. Um, Let's talk about something. You've mentioned a couple of things here that I want to pick up on. So one, as you mentioned earlier, there's a phrase that I love because I think it's uh, something we many people don't really consider that we do, and yet most of us do it. You use the word an echo chamber. Mm. Um, and the, for those not familiar, this is kind of the idea that we we search for things that we want to find the answers for. We already have an idea of what our view is. So you find things that reinforce that idea and you continually do that. So you're constantly in that echo chamber of, of you know, if you've got a political viewpoint, the chances are you'll, you'll find out and seek out articles that support that view rather than go against it. And of course, that reaffirms your view every time you read another article that, can, you know, that, that, that supports your ver- version. So you end up getting more and more politicized because you're, and that's an extreme example, but you know, that, that's the kind of thing we're talking about. If we, if we think about this in terms of mental health, I mean, the, the original apps, as I remember them, were really just kind of search engines. You'd use the app. If you had a problem, you'd, it would search the internet for an answer and come back with, you know, use your sprained ankle earlier. I think I've hurt my ankle. I'll use this app to help me find out what I've done wrong. You, you search, you, you write in what your, your symptoms are. It comes up with a range of things it could be and potential recoveries, you know, ice it, rest it, whatever. And they were kind of done in that in that form. I think where it suddenly shifted with the emergence of um, generative AI like ChatGBT is now you can have an interactive dialogue mm. with, these, with these places. So I can say to them, you know, I'm thinking like this, and it'll come back with a response. But where I think it might be quite dangerous, now make, make no mistake, there are a lot of benefits of, gen- of generative AI I've used intelligently and wisely and, and but it's only as good as the prompts that you give it. And that's the thing that people often forget. That's why there's a potentially going to be a huge emergence of prompt managers and prompt directors and the people that know how to prompt these, these generative AI machines better than others. And there's a skill involved here. But if you think about it from the layman, from layman's terms, if we have an issue, we're going to write into these, these apps, this generative AI, using ChatGPT as an example, what our potential problem is with our only the only view that we have, which is our own. And then we're going to continue down what I would call a potential rabbit hole in the way that we prompt it to give responses. The AI is only, only, going, to ever, only going to ever respond to the question we give it. It's not going to attempt to challenge our thinking. It's not going to attempt to contextualize where might this be going. You could write in there, for example, I'm struggling with this and I think I might do something drastic um, without, and I'm quite deliberately not going where that could be. But actually, the generative eye won't, won't understand the difference between right and wrong, and it will just give you the tools you need to take that kind of drastic action, potentially. And I think that's what could be really dangerous, because it, it could act as, a, as a, an echo chamber for an individual that is suffering from mental illness. And I wonder then, because it's so vast, it's not limited by specific boundaries that perhaps a, a mindfulness app may have. Well, yeah. Could that be quite dangerous? What's your view? I guess my view is, I mean, I, I, I largely agree with what you said. I, I think my view, is the, though, is, is this not just a further symptom of where we are struggling in society in general? Because if we're having to turn to, an, I mean, artificial intelligence to satisfy some basic human needs, such as effectively what you're saying is connection, yeah. Um, because that's what it's it's satisfying in that moment. We are making a, a game where putting a band aid on a, on a deeper issue. It just reminds me of this movie. I remember watching it uh, um, with Arnold Schwarzenegger, The Sixth Day. Have you seen The Sixth Day? No, I, I do know you've watched some terrible, terrible movies. Uh, <laughs> this is becoming quite, very it's apparent. A, it's one of his quite good movies, actually. Arnold Schwarzenegger's good movies. But anyway, in that, his colleague. <laughs> As effectively like a virtual girlfriend at home, right? She's some sort of hologram of some sort, whatever. You're definitely selling it. So she's programmed <laughs> to, you know, just I guess have a conversation with him and whatever else. <clears throat> and and it and it just and and I kind of somewhat relate to some degree because I live by myself, right? You you you've got wife, kids, and everything, so you you yeah. have that constant interaction. I don't. And I, I I remember watching a couple of days ago, someone had programmed chat GPT uh, or somehow done something and, and they've got some virtual hologram on a uh, on a like a picture frame and was literally having a conversation with this little puppy or dog was like humanizing the, the, the response to them. And I thought on one hand, that's great. 
And then on the other hand, I thought that's also terrifying. And they're both equally true, I think, for me, because on the one hand, it would actually be quite nice sometimes you come in and you, you chat to someone on your terms and, you know, you turn them off when you don't want to. And it, cause, yeah. But then that's not real life either, right? Because in a family, for example, you know, you're going to have conversations when, when really you do want to just switch off. And, and, that's, and I just feel like we're entering into a, a more and more isolated stage of existence where we're relying more and more on less human interaction yeah. and more. Uh, artificial I, I think you raise a, a really important point actually and I hadn't really thought about it in this context until you raised it right now which is you know you, you made a distinction of where we're different you live alone and I, I've got a family two you know two kids and um, who I love dearly and, and there's a concern here as a parent but there's a concern here for everybody but this is why it suddenly resonated with what you've just mentioned programs like Jack GBT are, are clearly not in my opinion a viable option for anyone looking for any form of therapy or diagnosis or anything like that. It's just not. And there's a reason for that as well. I, I think we've, we've got to a point in society, and we talk about this a lot on, on with HR, I talk about this on my other show or with HR leaders about how it's, it's an amazing thing that people are now talking openly about things like mental health. We've come an awful long way. This has evolved massively. The stigma that, that's attached to, to the term mental health hopefully are starting to be removed. Um, and I think that's really, really positive. But all of that comes from this related to the point you've just made about communication and community and social interaction. But I am terrified now that with the emergence of tools like generative AI, and unfortunately, my kids don't have access to this, but they will have in the future because the future is here and it's coming and the more of these tools are going to be produced and they'll be at different age groups and you, you, can, you can't control it. It's a beast. But the idea that my son or my daughter might ask an AI platform like ChatGBT, an answer to a very delicate ment mental related issue that could impact their mental health instead of being open and coming to me or mummy in this instance. I think that's frightening. At the moment, the first point of call for them, if they've got an issue, would be to come to me. And there's a trust there and there's an openness. But we all know whether you've been bullied in the playground and for those that have been through this kind of experience, and in any, anything, whether you're an alcoholic or, or, or whether you've, you've are recovering from, from, from drug, drug misuse, whatever it might be, one of the hardest things to do is to talk about it. And actually, they say often that's the first part of solving some of these major, major issues that we have to deal with. If we believe that talking about it is talking to a generative AI instead of talking to humans and having that social interaction, then potentially it could really undo a lot of the really, really good work that's been done to make these these stigmas go away and to talk openly about it. Because if we make it too easy for people to try and find a sim what they believe is a simple solution by entering these echo chambers and trying to find results that aren't verified and, and probably play, play around with all kinds of mental health ethics and all everything else, but it's easy. Question I would ask you, Harry, and I'd be interested to get your view on it is, should I be worried as a parent? Because will it mean that my kids stop asking, potentially stop asking me because it's easier? If, they got, if my daughter suddenly goes to mental health, uh, you know, eating disorder, maybe she's worried about something, you know, with all the social media pressures that you have out there as a, as, a, as a teenager. I would like to think she'd come to me if she's got a problem and we could talk about it openly. But maybe these yeah. tools prevent those dis, you know, that kind of discourse from taking place in the future. I, I, I don't, don't know, know whether the tools themselves prevent it, because if, I, if I'm honest, I think that that's uh, a, a challenge like of, of teenagers talking to parents openly about any of their emotions and feelings has been a challenge from, since the dawn of time. And, you know, you're, they're more, you were always back in the day, you got to find the information out in other ways rather than talking, like then talking to your parents. I'm sure like lots of teenagers or, you know, found out their information through reading cosmopolitan magazine. Right? That's certainly <laughs> what my sisters used to read when they were, when they were growing up and, or, you know, they, the uh, ask, agony aunt kind of column or uh, um now it's more social media right so they're like looking at different social media things they're going to do all that anyway now and they always did but just in other forms rather than talking to parents openly um i guess what i was thinking is that what i did as a as a teenager i never spoke to my parents really about any of this stuff that was going on in my head i did write a lot of it down though I still have those those books now. From the age of about ten, I, I was I was writing, um, and quite a lot through my teenage years. There was a lot going on then, 
but none, none of that i mean and, and as a as a guy we, we we're not known to be open with our emotions and our feelings and chatting to people about things so much maybe more so now but certainly back then and so i wrote a lot of it down now writing things down actually has been shown to be maybe as effective or or even more effective than talking to someone about a problem and why might that be well the reason is because sometimes when you talk to someone you may end up you know getting advice that you don't need or it might be that you're um you know they're kind of i guess reinforcing what you already are talking about whereas when you write it down and you reflect it's slightly different you don't have that 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 sounding board to come off and so i think sometimes it's shown it's more effective now the challenge with the ai stuff is that obviously it's not one way right so you can respond yeah yeah Yeah. you can write it it and it will respond um i feel like it's just rep- replacing what's maybe potentially already there, right? With whether that was like the the agony on in the column, which obviously is a human, but still, it's an anonymous anonymous person that's writing in. You With a generalized have, response, yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. So you're still getting it. So so there was still a problem then, um, or so I think it's just replicating the problems, but it's just making it more accessible to more people. So in my honest view, and and the more I go down this rabbit hole of technology and AI, the more I see, I'm going to sound a lot like a Luddite in a a, a bit. And I do see the irony in what (laughs) what I'm about to say, since I'm on Zoom right now on a laptop, we're releasing this on on apps. And you've been using ChatGBT to help you with your book title today. Yeah. And I, I just feel more and more as I see the younger and younger generations as well, growing up with this sort of technology, um that it's and i'm saying this to someone i think overall it's a net negative for younger people i think overall for society technology the internet like the uh availability of knowledge worldwide is a net positive but i would say for overall my overarching opinion is that for young people probably like you know 20 or less it's a net negative i mean it's a big question because you know i in work i do there's massive benefits to this i think in the context of our conversation about the mind and mindful paths and things that can take it, I have concerns about the power of the way that generative AI, like ChatGPT, could be used in a mental health context. For me, it's just not a viable option to be used. I think you gave a great, um, or in, in for those purposes, yet maybe that will change. You know, who knows what the future brings? But at the moment, it concerns me. It would concern me if my kids or my friend was using as people are, because you can Google this, there's a lot of information about people trying to utilize things like ChatGPT as, as a replacement for paid therapy. And, you know, as a coach myself, I'm, I'm alarmed at that. I'm not a therapist, but I'd be alarmed if someone tried to use it to replace what a human can do, which is contextualize and listen, actually, without without always responding and just ask further questions. ChatGPT is going to give you an answer. It won't necessarily prompt you to say what else what else what's really bothering what's actually below your your behind your body language that you're giving me i think that there's a concern there for me but just bringing it back to your point about journaling which i think you raised before hugely powerful tool it's it stood the dawn of time right so we're talking about lots of fads that come in and go journaling's been there since many many years people write things down that have worked it, it, it brings into uh, context something you mentioned in a previous episode about the power of a gratitude diary and actually how much is done for you um, writing down the things you're grateful for and over a period of time, how much of a positive impact they can have. So uh, since we last met, I read I read a book. Um, as you know, I love my parables. And I, I read a, a Zen book. It was, a, it was actually a Buddhist book. It wasn't Zen book. It was a Buddhist book. Uh, just about sayings and teachings. There was one in there, which I... It, I wrote it down because I thought it was really interesting. I only, I would not have written this down without your example, by the way, about the gratitude diary. So I thought you might like this. I'll, I'll bring it to today's thing. And I'll, I'll, I'll mention it to you. The story was a, a, a Buddhist monk was walking to another city. I, I can't recall where it was, but it was protected by gates. There's a soldier guarding the gates that interrogated him. And he said, who are you? Where are you going? And why are you going there? And the monk grew pensive and, and asked the soldier, can I ask you a question too? And the soldier says, what is it? And the soldier sort of wondered and aggressively sort of came towards him. And the monk said, what do you earn for one week's work? And the soldier says, two baskets of rice. The monk responds, I will bring you four baskets if you ask me these questions every day. And I thought that is 
so true to what you were saying. Where are who are you? Where are you going? And why are you going there? And I don't know, it brought the context of the journaling, the gratitude diary, those things, the power of you know well, self-inquiry. Yeah, exactly, right? And I think it related well, to, we, we had a question about what our poisons are and things in people's episodes and check them out. It, it'll sort of bring a lot of this into context. But also the context, of, as you said there, of, of not always answering back, having these questions for ourselves and helping our own selves find the answers to these poignant questions to help us in direction. A guy called Michael Neal, who's a coach that I massively respect. Yeah. He won't know it, but I've read a lot of his work. He, he comes up with something that um, I sp- tell my clients about, which is this. He said, you know, it's something called the lamppost metaphor. If we could go outside and everyone spoke to a lamppost for 30 minutes a day, the world would be in a much better place. The, now, the lamppost can't respond to you either. It's just the idea of us talking to somebody or some, not somebody, something, just talking openly and, la- and, and not listening to our inner voices, but having our external voices, listening to the sound of those words, listening to how we sound when we say something out loud. If you all did that for 30 minutes a day, how much, how helpful it could be. Um, Yeah. This is another reason why pets are so useful. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Great example. As someone that has two dogs, absolutely. You talk, you know, those that have pets, talk to them all the time. Talk to them all the time. Right. You know, there there was an interesting, I mean, not, not surprising to be honest, but experiment I remember reading about years ago where they took like stressed out city folk and um you know they they measured all that things like cortisol levels etc and a self-reflective uh, stress questionnaire and they gave them dogs for i think six weeks or eight weeks to sort of see how they get on and then they you know at the end of the six or eight weeks you know, stress levels had plummeted they're feeling much happier yeah. and, and none of them wanted to give the dogs back uh so i think they got all got to keep the dogs in the end as well um amazing you know it's you know, part of it's to do with obviously having to get out and walk them like a couple of times a day. Part of it's to do with physical touch, which is something I talk about. And people didn't really start really figure out until the pandemic. I've been talking about it for about 10 years, just how important physical touch is. Um, and and then part of it is, is going to be the conversation as well. Right. And, uh, and being able to to talk and have that. Part, somewhat... of, it's also, part of it's got to be the welcome they give you, no matter well, what day be, you've had as well. That's exactly. the best it's part of their day. someone happy to <laughs> see. <laughs> really bad you know, impression. Of and yeah, no, I was cycling home just now and I saw this cutest little dog and he was like, it, it reminded me of the dog from, um, you know, the movie The Mask with Jim Carrey back in the 90s, that kind of little white. <laughs> With I like, love your movie references. I love I, them. <laughs> I just, I, I just remember because I, I don't know the the type of dog that is, but it's a small dog, and it and it looked like Milo from from the mask, and he was like jumping up, and there's this little old lady walking him, and I was like, because normally I've always thought I wanted a dog, and I wanted like a cockapoo or a cavapoo, but then I saw this one, I was like, actually, that was a really kind of cute dog as well. I'd kind of go for one of those, but. <laughs> I've often thought for my own mental health, it'd be, you know, and I've been talking about it for about a year or two, but, uh, of, well, no, probably three years talking about a dog. I, I haven't yet got one just because I feel like along with the, the benefits comes the extra responsibility and, you know, having to not be away from them for too long, uh, which would be a challenge for me personally, because I'm, I'm out and about a lot. Um, but I've often thought that I'd probably be, a little bit happier with a dog maybe overall um so I mean, we've got it's not always positive We're, we've got a, a puppy at the minute and it's uh Ooh, we've got yeah. i mean it's literally defecating all over the house it's 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 a form of stress point of stress at the moment she's driving us up the wall i'm as cute as she is it's a little uh mini yeah. dashing so the, luckily the, the defecation is relatively tiny in comparison to our other dog who's 15 and a half years old I'm worried we're going to be, uh, have, you know, he's going to go in constant at just the time as he's, uh, you know, we'll get her trained right. and the other one will start. So uh, they can drive you up the wall as well. But I like the idea where, um, and you'll know, I, I've said this for, for many years, but it's um, you, your day doesn't dictate your mood, your mood dictates your day. And I think for me, if you've got a dog, they're always so positive. Mm. It's just coming, seeing them. I mean, we're detracting away from generative AI, I think for a minute here, but their mindset of just seeing you being the best part of their day and forgetting whatever they've been, they've got been in a cage for the last hour, or maybe they've been, you know, unattended or whatever. It's instantly forgotten when they see you. And they're just, it's so, they're so happy. Their day has not been ruined by the fact they've been neglected for the last hour or whatever they've been doing. 
because they're not letting their day dictate their mood. Their their mood is 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 dicta- right. dictates their day by seeing you. They're just happy. That it's that like, holding it, yeah. on to all those negative thoughts or things that we have as humans because we are so much more complex in that sense. I'll have to share mm. with you afterwards um, if you've not already seen it. The the little thing that goes on the internet is like cat diary versus dog diary. I don't know if you've heard of that. I haven't. I haven't. I'll have to share it with you, but it, it was like you know cat diary right so dog dog diary goes something like this right you know my owner rubbed my belly my favorite thing my owner took me for a walk my favorite thing i was given <laughs> food i love it already thing. and then and then cat diary is like day 839 of my captivity these humans are like you know, <laughs> i tried to, i tried to kill one of them the other day by walking in between its legs at the top of the stairs and it just patted me and thought i was cute and then it talks about the dog being a being a um like a traitor and, and something like that love I love it i love it already bringing, bringing it back to um like things like ai and chat gpt is you've obviously i'm sure and dogs as well to kind of link it together um you know all the kind of robot type dogs that they 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 kind of develop in and robot pets and ai pets that you know we used to have those tamagotchis wasn't it back in the I day i remember tamagotchi yeah if you didn't feed yeah, it, I never tiny had it machine, and, die and, and, yeah. and and again it just goes for me i i can see a bigger picture with all of this stuff is that we're trying to use technology ultimately to replicate the natural well i i don't know if we can argue dogs are natural because we we domesticate them but like the natural order of things in some way shape or form right so we're using ai to have our conversations instead of have that with the pe- person we're using um you know zoom to have meetings rather than in person now don't get me wrong of course these have you know we wouldn't be able to have this otherwise right because you're all the way in like devon and I, i'm in london but the more and more we skew towards this the more it reminds me of just a very isolated and lonely future that we could be heading towards if we if we embrace these without thinking too much and actually um yeah. i was listening i said to before i was listening to joe, uh, joe rogan podcast earlier where he was he's talking with a journalist i think um at the time and they, they were talking about ai and and joe rogan was mentioned how he was on the on the text to um elon musk the day before about some of this stuff but elon musk has suggested like a six month kind of freeze let's say on on any of this ai business and development just so we can take stock and breathe and maybe come up and formulate some kind of best practice best way or something like that because i think we are so excited about a, a new technology it's like like i say we are infants when when it comes to our evolution i, I, yeah, I like that i like that idea we're just starting to play with our toys we're just starting to play with it and, and and we have no idea how these things work and we're just breaking things and and, and running running before we can walk really uh and i think that's where we're going to be for a, a few hundred years if i'm honest i think uh, you know it's gonna take a few a few I hundred mean, years a- ai i'm a massive Fan. I drive a Tesla, so I drive an electric car, bringing Elon Musk in. So the AI involved in that is amazing. But as AI in everything we do, we're looking at Netflix. It knows what shows we like and what we watch next. That's AI. Uh, the phones that we use, the the, the 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 anything that has smart in the title is using some form of AI to to, to deliver that smart capability. Um, there are people using robot Hoovers, which actually is incredibly complex robotics and AI involved in those kind of things. It managed to learn how to where to go and map your room and not where not to go. And I mean, AI is incredibly impressive. I think where the concern comes in and like everything, there's always concern where there's lack of knowledge or understanding and, and we resist it. And I'm definitely in that camp a little bit at the minute is in, this is the first kind of form of AI where it can respond to, to you rather than just, do what we want it to do to, in a different kind of context. So I think that's slightly concerning for me in terms of the way that's used. It feels more think, human. It's more human. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, exactly. So I think we're referencing it to what you mentioned there in the Joe Rogan podcast. I haven't listened to it, but whether we need a gap, the reason this has suddenly exploded in the public domain is because I think I think things like ChatGPT, we're on version four now, right? So when it hit the market, I think it hit the market at version two or version three. That was in November. Yeah, but what I mean is it, it wasn't the first iteration of it. It's been around for about five years, but it's been it's been confined to the select few in that world. And they just dropped it on the masses. And it's the widespread adoption of this technology has been around for years. It just hasn't been 
around for public consumption in the way that it has. And it suddenly became open source and it's gone, whoa, everyone's just gone, wow, and it, we've hit it. So it's, it's yeah, I don't know what the answer is. I, I think we just need to be act with a little bit of caution. If you listen to this and you're using it to solve issues that, that, that go beyond the confines or boundaries of what it's designed for, just be cautious, I think. You know, it, it's not a therapist. It hasn't got the training. It'll be utilizing resources that may or may not have been verified. If you're using it to write articles, you may well be plagiarizing someone else's work. That work may not be accurate. It's like going to Wikipedia and assuming everything on Wikipedia is fact. It's not. Yeah. Um, no, if I, I used to be... I, I assume or, everything or magazine. is not fact these days. Um, no, well, but, exactly. I mean, look, I think with AI... I, and again, I, I don't reference any specific movie, but you watch any science fiction movie in the future. Sometimes oh, no, they're... please reference one because I love your reference. No, I, 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 I can't, think, I've never of, heard I can't of. think of what I'm referencing, but I'm just saying <laughs> that you sometimes see like the, the kind of the cop talking to a, like an AI therapist or something like that. And so I feel like AI, um, I remember when I read, what book was it? But it was either not Sapiens, but it was one of the same author, you know, um, whose name I can never remember that, the Israeli guy, Yuval Novel Harara, or whatever his name is, the one who wrote Sapiens and whatever else. And um, and he's talking that things like AI and, and everything, effectively, almost all jobs are going to become obsolete with the adoption of this technology. I think the only one he mentioned that wouldn't be is archaeology. So if you're starting to become an archaeologist, you're probably safe for a bit. But pretty much everything else, because if you think about it, people are using chat GPT and everything for like marketing copy and you can get, you know, um, coding as well. So like you can create whole code with that instead of employing coders. And so it may only be a matter of time before there is like coaching. Therapy. Your, your audio is cutting here, Harry. You might have to go oh, back sorry. over. Okay. Is it back on? Is it back on the audio? No, you've, you lost your internet. It's, it's really crackling. Yeah. Uh, my internet's there. Now you're clear again. Now just go back to what okay. AI is doing. Just just rephrase well, that bit again. I'll edit it in. Okay. Um, I'm not sure where I started now, but um, did you hear that bit about Sapiens? No. Yeah. Go from there. Go from there. Okay. So uh, the the guy who wrote Sapiens in one of his other books, um, he talks about how AI is going to effectively replace every job, right? Except for possibly archaeology right so archaeology is safe as a career but every other job pretty much can be replaced with ai and already we're seeing that with chat gpt and being able to write marketing copy with chat gpt um write essays for undergraduate level using it um and actually it won't be that long before you know people are using it as you described right for therapy and counseling and uh, coaching um whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, I guess as it evolves, we'll, time will tell because it gives more accessibility to more people to be able to maybe imagine if your wisdom was able to be replicated a thousand fold. Yeah. And then you'd be able to reach more people. Now, of course, you don't have the context and you don't have that the nuance. But is that better than nothing? I don't know. Is it is it better? No, I don't than... know if I know. I mean, I did I... it just to have. A th um, let me just. I'm gonna have a little pause. I'll edit it back in in a second. I'm gonna do a little Google on something. My son just walked in as well, but I'll take this out of the edit. Um, give me a second because I, I interviewed a guy on a very similar subject. I want to get it up so I get the name right. Um, there it was. Who was who was the guy I interviewed? Really interesting. Okay, that's fine. I'll come back to that in a second. Sorry, mate. I was just um, my son came in and ruined it, so I'm just breaking, <laughs> breaking thing. That's Sorry, right. wait, 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 wait. we were just saying, talking about your your water. Well, so look, the question is, this this is going to happen where 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 AI is going to permutate through every aspect of society, just like the internet has, right? And you know, the internet is now being used for everything. Right? You can't think of anything that, that isn't really being maybe yeah. touched by the internet, like career-wise. And the same thing will happen with AI. Um, does that then make us obsolete, right, as humans, because AI can suddenly take over most jobs? Maybe in the jobs that we're currently doing, 
but there'll always hopefully be somewhere for us to I mean, look, into. Th- this is in a field that I know well, which is recruitment, right? And I did, I did a, I did a podcast, uh, an HR podcast with a guy called Jeff Wald, who wrote the book The End of Jobs. Uh, the mm. rise of on-demand workers and agile corporations. And I did that podcast, I think, back in 2018. So that book will be 2018. But at that point, I think there was also a, a Deloitte-funded study that was published by the BBC, which is, which actually, I think mean, you can still find it. It ranked all the jobs that would likely be out um, made redundant by automation, which was the, the, the buzzword at the time there rather than AI, by 2025. We're 2023 now. Now, I, I operate in, in, in my recruitment business in the world of, of HR and payroll. And they said then that the 97% of all HR and payroll positions would be automated by 2025. I mean, it's just not going to happen. It doesn't happen. Um, and we, I think there's, a, there's an element where, for, for, for media headlines, we like to cash, catastrophize. Yeah. We like to say this is going to happen. Oh, yeah. I think there's, there's reality. AI is absolutely, absolutely going to replace jobs, but it'll displace a lot as well. And where the old jobs go, new jobs are formed. And I mentioned yeah. earlier about the idea of being prompt managers or prompt yeah. directors. Yeah, these are new jobs created by AI as well. Yeah. I think it was a, I can't get the exact stats, but there was a European forum study that was announced. I, I think the, the numbers were something along the lines of 57 million jobs would be uh, no longer be in existence by 2025, but they'd be replaced by 87 million new ones, which mm. gives you a, a, a you know a net difference of sort of best part of 30 million new jobs coming into the market. So you know it, it, you can you can look at it with your well, we, I'm definitely a, a glass half a half full kind of guy anyway, right? But there's there's two there ways. Definitely, of looking, you know, there will definitely be it. these new jobs. I feel like these new jobs though will be us managing higher and higher levels what do i mean by that it means that as as we start and and it, this, okay you like movies right going back to movies right so in, you like movies <laughs> well i like movies but you like me referencing movies but i do the matrix movies right so the the original the second or third one where uh, the leader of the um zion place he's talking to neo and he's showing how um, the pumps work, or he, he's, he's showing the pumps that that breathe air into Zion and give life to Zion. And he's talking to him, and he and he says, "Well, you know, do you know how these work?" And and Neo's like, "No." And the guy says, "Like, yeah, neither do we, right? We don't, right?" And 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 it reminded me that as we start to allow AI and automation to take care of the the nitty gritty, if you like. And we start taking the higher and higher level responsibilities. We're going to know less and less about how things actually work. Like, for example, if you went back in time, a thousand years, and you were asked, and you were to tell someone a thousand years ago all about, oh, there's this thing called the internet and electricity and all that, you wouldn't have a clue, most likely, the average person, right? They wouldn't have been of interest either because their role would be, they were living in a world of scarcity. They're thinking about, I need to get food on the table. and yeah, but you wouldn't be able to explain how it works, though. How does electricity no. work? You would be like, I don't know. I just turn a switch. and I think, you... think I could explain it now, Harry. <laughs> no, I, I don't know. I could fully, right? And I did a <laughs> in science, right? But we are going to know less and less about those things because they're going to be taken over by, sure. by other things which I guess is fine because we're going to have other things that we need to worry about. Well, but... we, we, we lose the skill of the doing, but we, we gain skills in strategic thinking and, and, and broader I... thinking in other areas, potentially. Well, the reason I bring this up is because I feel like, uh, and this might be going to me catastrophizing, is that a little bit, is that I think ultimately we're, we're knowing less and less about fundamentals of how to be a human. What do I mean? Like, if if the apocalypse came tomorrow, right, how many people could really forage for food or, or or skin an animal or, you know, you know, build a shelter or find water or do anything that actually requires our survival? I mean, we'd adapt and we'd probably have to learn. But I feel like, you know, they'd know how to take a selfie of them struggling to find water, but they wouldn't know how to, how to actually find the water themselves. Right. And I feel like we are becoming you talked about smart stuff before and I've always joked, right, you know, the smarter the homes get, the smarter the technology gets, the dumber the person, right? Smartphone, dumb person. And I feel like the smarter things are getting, the dumber we are. I mean, I remember growing up, I, I would know about 30 of my mate's telephone numbers off by heart. No problem. Right? Yeah. I, had no, yeah. I don't even know my mum's telephone number right now, her mobile phone number um, or anyone's really, just mine. 
And I feel like we're turning off, or, or, or you know, going back to our first meeting, right? The whole map situation where we had to cycle to Paris and with the maps. Now it's all GPS, right? Before, back in the day, I would know how to get there. I would look at a map. I'd almost like photograph it in my head so I knew how to get there. Because And this came from when I was traveling because I never wanted to hold a map. Just take out. a pause. For some reason, you're, you're just well, hold it. I'm just going to, don't want to lose you with the audio. You're crackling in and out again. Um, Ooh, so weird. It seems to come back when you pause from it. So just I'll let you just pick up in a moment. Hopefully it comes back. Just just, just go just have your tea, Web, and jump jump back into what you were saying, and then we'll no one will ever know. I'll pick it. I'll edit it out. Where am I starting from? Um, okay, so <laughs> so back in the day when I would be traveling, I would effectively learn the route I needed to take by looking at the map because I didn't want to bring the map out when you're walking in a strange city because it's an obvious sign that you're a tourist, sure. right? So I would learn all these things and I would know exactly where I wanted to go. And my memory was, I've always prided myself on having quite a good memory, like memorizing all the numbers. I memorized hundreds of quotes for my A-level languages and hundreds of equations for my uh, science A-levels and degrees. And I just feel that as we rely more and more and more on this technology, yeah, we don't need to remember stuff because the stuff's there, but are we also losing some ability of critical thinking of Yeah, we lose solving? the ability to think for ourselves. Exactly. And I, I think totally agree. I think that people are becoming <laughs> and I might be a bit biased here because I saw something online the other day which just made me laugh. But it was a guy going around and he was asking some really simple questions to people in america i think it was there they all i think it was in america in times square or somewhere and uh and he would be asking things like okay so which country do you think the queen of england's from or where what country yeah, i think i've Canada seen the same thing. And, and i think i've, I think I've seen the same no thing idea. they're like oh africa i'm like mm. and i was just thinking i mean obviously this is you know edited and like i'm sure there was lots of different responses but but i just feel like uh, as we become in less and less uh, more and more I mean, adept to this technology, we're becoming less and less adept to our own. I would agree. And there's a danger of it being a self-fulfilling prophecy that as we become less able to think for ourselves, it makes us more reliant yeah. to go to technology to find the answers. So it becomes self-fulfilling. The less we learn, the more we need to go elsewhere to get the responses we need, which draws us in, of course, to generative AI. It draws us into chat GPT. Yeah. We lose the ability to think for ourselves we lose the ability to retain knowledge because it's no longer needed our brain does no. our, our bodies are so good at adapting it thinks i don't need to retain this because i can go and find it tomorrow on chat gpt i don't need to so it won't store it and i think therefore becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy so and, let's go on oh well i was gonna say and and maybe that's fine because actually we we don't need to we don't need to be memory banks as such but we do need to understand um principles this is what i i think we, i might have mentioned it before in an earlier conversation but when i'm talking to people like my mum, trying to explain technology to her i'm trying to say don't focus on the process focus on the principles so i, I want to teach her principles of technology rather than like so if she wants to do a certain thing on technology right i don't know find a new menu or whatever i don't want to tell her how to do that because she won't remember but if i teach her principles like for example you know usually if you like you press and hold on on a smartphone maybe another option might come up or it might highlight something usually if there's three dots it means there's another menu behind there usually if you if you make a, a, a commit to an action you usually have a cancel option if you understand principles rather than the actual how to do things you become a lot more comfortable with with using the technology and i feel like a lot of people are not on that they they, they don't quite understand the principles of things and they're more into I think, into i think you brought it full circle which is an interesting way i'm conscious of uh, of our listeners and of time as well i think we've been in a really interesting uh, conversation it certainly has been for me on on chat gpt i don't know you know i'm, I'm interested to see where it takes us but you you raised a couple of things interestingly you talked about the apocalypse, apocalypse came tomorrow because we know where to get our water from you know we'd know how to take a selfie and there may be a lot of people listening to this going well that's okay right we don't need to to worry about where we get our water from they use the apocalypse example. No, we don't need it until we do. It's a bit like it's, it's not a problem 
until it is. And therefore, we need to take actions to prevent whatever that problem might be from becoming a problem. So that's why you take preventative action. And by the same token, it works the other way. We don't need to know where to get water from until we do. And we don't know what the future holds. We're in a we're in an economic climate of, of turmoil, of, of destruction, of war, of, of political uncertainty, of of um, what's, the, what's the word I'm looking for, of climate change, of, of all these things, right? I just think there's it's important we all keep a sense of self and a sense of awareness of the th- of how we do things and the information that actually we may not need to retain it. It can just be helpful to do so anyway. You know, just taking a slightly different approach, mindful approach, really, to some of the tools that we have access to and being aware that it might be good to understand why we need that information rather than just always rely on getting it. It's a bit like when you you use the um, the GPS example earlier, right? And I'm sure most people have been in this situation where you go somewhere and suddenly, for whatever reason, you run out of signal, your battery goes dead, or your, your sat-nav stops working, and suddenly we're completely lost. Yeah. I mean, I just want to, um, I, I, and this has been an episode of me quoting lots of films, but I want to throw another one at you just to kind of finish off. Go on, um, it's a great way to finish the show. Now, now it's it. not necessarily a brilliant film, but I think it highlights... But well, not, most of the ones you mention aren't, so that's good. Uh, it's called um, have you heard of this one it's about 2004 it came out called idiocracy i don't think i have so idiocracy let me just to highlight uh, it's about so it's um the act is uh, i think it's um clive wilson so um oh i love uh, clive wilson so maybe i'll have to watch this one yeah so he's a he's an army guy and he's not doing very well so he's been put in some sort of basement somewhere to look at the records and his way of getting out of the basement is he volunteers for this experimental program this experimental program puts him in a cryo freeze for 12 months now during that 12 month period that he's in the cryo freeze i know they lose funding it gets mothballed whatever and so he ends up being frozen for like 500 years and he wakes up 500 years later and he and um, first thing he sees is, is in some guy's apartment, and and this is how stupefied the the people have become. And he's sitting in this big chair, and the chair has got everything he needs, like the big gulp drink. He's got a toilet in the chair. He's got six screens. He's playing computer games on one screen and watching TV on another. And what happened is that all the smart people from five hundred years ago, there were um, you know waiting for the right time to get married and waiting a bit longer for having kids and all that. So then they became too old to have kids. So then all the people that were sitting at home watching crappy daytime TV ended up like having like lots of kids and the population became them. And he looks outside the window and like the, the tree the the buildings are falling down, but they're kind of stuck together with duct tape because no one has got any engineering skills. skills he goes, yeah. he goes to the doctor and he, and this happens actually these days. They think he's a genius. No, no, he goes to the doctor with condition and the doctor is like trying to find the right button to like push based on the symptoms he has to give him the diagnosis. So he's not actually assessing the person. He's just trying to say, what do you, what box do you fit in that I can press the button? And um, yeah, and the guy actually ends up being the genius because he, so they, none of the plants are growing. They're all starving to death because none of the plants are growing. (laughs) And they're, they're saying, I don't understand why the grass isn't growing and the plants aren't growing. We're, we're giving them everything they need, right? And they're watering it with like Gatorade or something like that. And he's like, I think if we just gave them water, you know, it'd be all right. It ends up being like this, the, the smartest person on the planet. And I, it was a, tr- a tricky movie to watch because it's so bad, but it took me about three years to watch it because I watched half of it one year. Then Harry, kudos where it's due. I haven't seen it. I'm definitely going to go and watch this before we next meet. I think that if it's the show that I've just visualised in my mind, hey, I love Clive, um, Clive anyway, um, Clive Wilson anyway, that sounds like a perfect example of what we've been talking about. Yeah, Absolutely. and that's what we're heading towards. It's Hang on, towards. nailed it. This was nailed only 20 it. years ago, this movie. There you go. I'm going to check it out. Um, and my favourite movie I think that he did was Drill Bit Taylor, which is uh, not worth mentioning. It just yeah, made me laugh. Yeah. Yeah, I've seen that, yeah. Probably a good place to leave the show. Listen, Harry, it's been a real pleasure. Um, I think we're going to meet next week. We're going to talk about your beat model, your, beat, your leadership beat model. So I'm excited to get into that. Um, but listen, I hope you have a great week. Uh, I hope this is enjoying the shows and I will see you again in, a, in, a, in seven days time. Absolutely. Pleasure as always. Good time. Cheers, Harry. All the best, mate. And we're good. I'm just going to sit down.